just the name is filled with sounds of voodoo magic and throbbing drums. You can feel the gentle sea breezes and the warm tropical sunshine. This jewel of the Caribbean seems so innocent, surrounded by azure sea, rising quickly to lush green mountain ranges. Haiti, an aboriginal word, means mountainous land. And so it is. From the country's highest mountain, all one can see is more mountains, endless mountains. A Haitian proverb says it so well. Beyond the mountains, more mountains. Just as mountains rise beyond more mountains, so the problems of Haiti rise beyond more problems. Problems that to many North Americans seem insurmountable and to many Haitians seem impossible. Beyond its poverty, illiteracy that rises to 80%. Beyond illiteracy, hunger. Beyond hunger, sickness and death. 41% of Haiti's children die before they reach the age of 15. since the European invaders smashed the original Indian population, Haiti has been the battleground of Spanish and French colonialists, has seen the horrors of African slave trading, has witnessed the blood mixing of African slaves with her European conquerors, has recorded the self-liberation of the slaves from their cruel white masters, and today struggles to catch up with the world around it while carrying the burdens of malnutrition, illiteracy, and poverty that cripple Haiti. As a visitor, there is so much to see. It may be the famous fortress La Citadelle, built by King Henry Christophe atop a more than 900-meter mountain near Cape Haitien. It took 16 years and tens of thousands of men to build La Citadelle. Or, at the foot of the same mountain, Christophe's palace, built in likeness to the French palace of Versailles, called Sanssouci, or without worry. You may want to travel the coastal road from Port-au-Prince, the country's capital, and visit a fishing village, or possibly take a ride in a Haitian sailboat. It may be a flight over the mountains, or a noisy ride in a jitney taxi called a top top. Only one and a half hours by air from Miami is a rare opportunity to become immersed in a culture that has primitive roots going back to African slaves. Its lack of sophistication sets it apart from the typical holiday paradise of the slick brochures. Haiti is not a country of crowded, mile-long beaches with sun-seekers from the affluent north. You mix with the people. Like it or not, you're aware of the intense struggle that these people face daily, a struggle to merely survive. Yet you know that their struggles and sorrows are mixed, mixed with the simple joys of life, the joys of friends and family. This blending of sound, smell, and color invades your mind and forces you to re-examine life, its values and priorities. But Haitians are proud of their country, and nowhere is this pride better reflected than in their art. Be it the bold paintings and sculpture in the expensive galleries, or the forest of mahogany carvings in the famous iron market, you will find something to suit your eye and pocketbook. The vibrant, throbbing marketplace. The quiet, residential mountain slopes. The panorama of the endless sea. All capture the beauty of a country rich in history, 
facing the challenges of the contemporary world. Haiti's economy must expand to compete in the North American business community. Haiti's people must be drawn from the listless centuries of the past to the present. Agriculture is still the basis of Haiti's economy. 80% of Haiti's population obtains its livelihood from agriculture. Haitians consume 85% of what they produce, but agricultural products make up 62% of their exports. Thus, they consume most of their own potential exports. This allows for little trade and a very modest annual growth. The cash crop of sugar is such an example. Walking down a street, you'll see people of all ages finding their candy treat in sugar cane. Cane was brought from the Canary Islands to Haiti in 1506. Handled by peasants, the cane is cut, then transported to the refineries. Here it is crushed and the juice is extracted. The juice is evaporated into syrup in large vats. Haitian leaders recognize that for Haiti to become a progressive country, increased industrialization is necessary. This is not easy. With a mainly rural people, most with little or no education, job training is an uphill battle. Only 7% of Haiti's population is involved in any form of industrial employment. Haitians mine two ores, bauxite and copper. This bauxite mine near Miraguan is one of the most productive in Haiti. Surprisingly, fish is not a major part of the diet of the Haitian, although the country is bounded by the sea on three sides. Heavy trawling is not feasible because of the coral reefs that surround Haiti. The Haitian fishermen's equipment and vessels are primitive and handmade. The catch, be it shrimp, lobster, or lombi, must be sold and eaten soon after it is caught because there is no means of refrigeration. But perhaps the most important thing that keeps the Haitian from making a living from the sea is a throwback to his African roots. The Haitian fears the spirits of the deep, spirits of the Haitian religion, Voodoo. Voodoo, a word that conjures up images of black magic ritual, of symbolic dolls, of throbbing drums. Haitian voodoo is a strange synthesis of 15th century European Christianity and West African tribal religions. These people have gathered at a local voodoo temple to dance and sing to the spirits, to call on them and invite them to possess the body of their priest and speak through him. The slaves carried into their land of exile a dominating belief in the immortality of the soul. Colonial leaders confused them. They talked of God while committing acts of brutality against the slaves. The Europeans denied the slaves the right to practice their native religions. But the Africans did retain the rudiments of their tribal faith by compromising with their taskmasters. Religion was their solace, their source of identity. It gave expression to their view of life and the world. Their roots, although uprooted from the soil of Africa, were not destroyed, just transplanted. Voodooism differs from most religions in that it does not worship gods. Instead, the voodoo god enters the human body and speaks through that person. The drive of voodoo is the participation when the spirit possesses and speaks through the person. The dances and trances are expressions of this union of sensual body and aspiring soul. There is no distinction between good and evil. This voodoo priest is at the altar in the inner chamber of the temple. The inner chamber has a center pole, sometimes resembling a serpent. Here, the spirits, the loa, 
enter and leave. During the ceremony, the priest makes a series of intricate drawings with flour on the dirt floor of the temple. While he calls on the spirits, the people outside dance and make music on their handmade instruments. Finally, the spirit enters the body of the voodoo priest. Voodoo, although rejected by the elite as being a peasant religion, is an integral part of the Haitian psychological makeup. Like any culture, Haiti has its spectator sports. Car racing is too expensive, but cockfighting provides one of the few diversions to the hard-working life of the peasant. Cockfighting demands careful breeding, not unlike the prestigious bloodlines of racehorses. After the bets are made, the crowd eagerly steps back from the ring. The fight begins. The agony of defeat. The ecstasy of victory. To the uninitiated, the dripping blood and flying feathers may seem savage, but unlike North American sports, no human limbs are broken. No human blood is spilt. The visitor can be enthralled by the noisy color of the marketplace, by the hypnotic sounds of the carnival, and by the friendly smiles of the Haitian people. But the mountains loom large. The mountains of disease, of poverty, of illiteracy, of overcrowding. The mountains are still always there. Many say they can't be scaled. They say Haiti's future will be strangled by the mountains. But some believe the mountains can be conquered. They believe that there are solutions to the problems of Haiti. Amos Zer is one of these people. Years ago, after Amos had retired from his job as a sewage engineering consultant in Fort Wayne, Indiana, he was asked to come to Grace Children's Hospital in Haiti. The hospital had a sewage treatment problem that Amos could help them with. Grace Children's Hospital is the only children's hospital that specializes in treating tuberculosis in all of Haiti. Yet tuberculosis is one of the most widespread, most deadly diseases in all of Haiti. It has been estimated that 90% of Haiti's population has had contact with TB. Many Haitian children are severely malnourished. Their weak bodies cannot fight the TB germs. Traditional beliefs also help TB spread. Some Haitians believe that all the doors and windows of their houses must be shut tightly at night to keep out evil spirits. In this close atmosphere, TB germs pass from person to person quickly. Amos fell in love with the needy children at the hospital and help them by using the skills he had worked with all his life. I first came to Haiti at the request of one of my colleagues to cope with a sewage problem that they had at a children's hospital. And what I saw when I came here was really not to my liking. I, I had uh, seen the poverty. I saw the plight of hundreds of little children whose bodies were racked with tuberculosis. And I went home and I had almost convinced myself that there was nothing that I could do in such a situation but these little faces kept coming into my life at times when I least expected them, and they were speaking to me and asking me questions that I couldn't answer. Here was a mountain Amos knew how to scale. He knew how to take the Haitian people beyond this mountain. The Lord was trying to tell me that while I couldn't solve all the problems of Haiti, the, what I could do, I needed to do, even if that was only one thing, and so I, I did come back, I became involved, and it's probably one of the most important decisions that I've ever made in my entire life. I discovered when I came to Haiti to investigate the sewage problem that the hospital had, that there was no sewage treatment available to the hospital. In fact, there is no a sewage treatment plant in the entire city of Port-au-Prince, and so it became necessary for us to, to design and construct a septic tank that was adequate to uh, treat the sewage 
and then about a year later, we were able to acquire land across the road where we built this lagoon, and the effluent from the tank is now pumped into the lagoon and is dissipated by evaporation into the atmosphere. Scaling the mountains takes people, and God knows who can do it, and chooses them for the task. The medical training and life experiences of Madame Marie Belland helped her to know her mountain. Madame Belland was born in the Haitian coastal city of Kais. She met her husband Patrick while both were studying in North American universities. But the good life in North America was not satisfying to this Haitian couple. As Marie said, we always planned to come back to serve our people. They needed us. Marie's nursing skills and devotion to children found their greatest use at Grace Children's Hospital. Marie is director of nursing at the hospital. She is part of the highly skilled medical staff at Grace Hospital. Men and women who have saved the lives of thousands of TB-stricken children since the hospital opened. In North America, tuberculosis is only a memory, a disease of the past. But to the Haitian, tuberculosis is maladitikai, the sickness of the little house, and it means death. Tuberculosis is called the sickness of the little house because of the profound influence of voodoo. When a child has tuberculosis, the voodoo priest tells his parents to put him in a little house that has been built beside the family home and leave him there. If good spirits are making the child sick, he will recover. If the child is full of bad spirits, he will die as he should. Many times, a child is almost dead before his mother brings him to Grace Children's Hospital. Tubercle bacilli have invaded his body. His lungs or affected organs begin to rot. The child's recovery may be slow. It may take many months. But because of the skill and love of Marie and the other hospital staff, this child has a chance to scale his mountain. He has a chance for life. <laughs> Haitian pastor Andre Forestal was given the chance for new life many years ago. He, in turn, dedicated his life to doing the same for his people. When Andre was a child, he was saved from dying of a terrible illness. Andre has climbed his own mountain. He was the son of a voodoo priest. But Andre knows that Haiti's future is not secure in the hands of voodoo leaders. He knows that the people need better health care to fight the diseases of the past. Andre is part of a tuberculosis immunization program, a program that will soon cover the entire country. Hundreds of thousands of Haitian children and young people below the age of 20 have already been vaccinated. Hundreds of thousands of children will not die because of tuberculosis. Andre put himself through Bible college. After he graduated, he became the pastor of a small church at Carrefour de Chalon near Miraguan. When he came to the church, it had few members, but Andre is a vibrant, sincere speaker and pastor. Now, people walk for many miles to hear Andre preach on Sunday. Being a pastor is only one of Andre's jobs. His talent for reaching his people makes him a vital part of the TB immunization program. He works with advanced teams planning where and when vaccination clinics will be held. He visits these areas and discusses plans for the clinic with the chef de section or the section chiefs, the local authorities. At an advanced planning meeting, Andre tells the people about the disease of tuberculosis. He tells them that they can save the lives of their children by having them vaccinated. 
Andre must be away from his own children sometimes for weeks at a time. Andre introduces his family. Madame Mouin, Ed Sovli, Madouche, Edmise, Esther, Marianne, Andre, et moi. When the immunization program capped, crusade against tuberculosis began years ago. It needed a leader, a strong, able person to direct the work. The person chosen to scale this mountain was Henry Coop, a retired pharmacist from Canada. Henry and his wife, Agnes, accepted this challenge. They left their home and the prospect of peaceful retirement years to help the people of Haiti. When we came here four and a half years ago, it was a time when a new program was being planned, a public health approach. It was prevention rather than treatment. We felt that while the hospital work was good and valuable, it was not enough, and that in order to make a strong impact on the problem of tuberculosis in Haiti, we had to concentrate on a preventive campaign, a mass immunization, which would prevent people from getting sick rather than treating them after they became sick. It's a, an important work that needed to be organized and developed and planned and carried out. We formed our teams. We put them together into workable units. We worked under a contract with the Haitian Department of Health through the police chiefs in order to uh, make the proper arrangements to give the whole country coverage so that would, all the people would be vaccinated in a particular district. Here in Miraguan, we were happy, but there were times when we were a bit lonely. We were away from family and friends, and uh, uh, although I had my work and was busy, so I didn't have as much time to be lonely as Agnes did, uh, there were times when we missed uh, family and friends and home. And the work goes on as the program is carried into more distant regions of Haiti. This is a tremendous satisfaction to me, me personally because I feel that it's a very important work. The people of Haiti are suffering from uh, tuberculosis to a an unbelievable degree. There are over 200,000 active tubercular cases in Haiti. This is really the only way that you can have an impact on that situation. You have to prevent the disease. It's impossible to find the people and treat them and keep them on medication for that length of time. There are different ways of witnessing to your faith. Uh, Jesus has demonstrated to us how uh, we are to respond to need. That was one of his main ways of showing us how to live. And I think to me it comes most natural to uh, express my faith in a service uh, to people in need uh, in a way which I have been trained to do. To me this seems to be the most natural and the, the most effective way that I can speak for my faith by doing what I'm doing. The Mountains of Haiti. International Child Care is one organization that sees the mountains and beyond. Our mission in Haiti began with fighting TB among its children. And we're moving ever forward into multiple immunizations, into fields of primary health care, and into integrated community development. We are able to do this through the dedication of people like Amos Zare and Henry Coop. And we'll continue to progress because of the involvement of Haitian people like Marie Belland and André Forestal. And you can be part of it. You can help the people of Haiti climb their own mountains. First, we want you to scale the mountain of your own commitment. Your commitment to God, to your family, and to your church. They need you. They need you to give of yourself. Then, we invite you as part of your commitment to be a partner to a Haitian worker. There is a Haitian worker who needs your help. Isaiah the prophet wrote, 
How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who bring the happy news of peace and salvation, the news that the God of Israel reigns. You've seen the mountains of Haiti. You've seen the beauty of the Haitian people. You've seen the loving dedication of God's workers in Haiti. Let the mountains lift you to God. Take a moment now to examine your personal Christian commitment. You can share in this ministry of international child care in Haiti. Let the spirit of Christian caring direct you. Support the exciting ventures of international child care in the vibrant country of Haiti. Look beyond the mountains.